if you haven't got standards, what's the point of doing anything? Um, my big thing, and it was instilled into me at a young age by dad, is whatever you do, do it the best of your ability. Uh, and someone who doesn't prepare well or doesn't give themselves the best opportunity of succeeding will succeed, mm. but intermittently. Mm. And I wanted to say to try and be the best I could be every single day. Hello guys, it's Ebs here and I hope you've had an amazing week. Welcome back to the Art of Success podcast episode 15 and I hope you've had an amazing week. I'm doing well, I'm actually in Australia at the moment in Perth sunning it up whilst recording this so no complaints from me. Um, If it is the first time you're listening to the podcast just to give you a little bit of background it's really all about unpicking inspiration motivations and strategies for success in life from incredible people who just achieved amazing things across a range of fields my background itself my name's ebony jewel rainford brent i'm a former elite athlete broadcaster and i'm just passionate about personal development and personal performance and what it really takes to maximize our potential Um, So today on the podcast, uh, those who listen to Richard Osman, there's been a lot of feedback, a lot of people tuned in, um, amazing insight. And today I actually get to speak to one of my sporting heroes. This is someone I loved growing up, loved watching. And considering I've been doing this podcast for a while, this is the first cricketer on here and it can only be reserved for one person. Uh, This is Alex Stewart, OBE, who's a former England and Surrey cricketer. I know it's a mixture of fans here. Some are into sport, some aren't. Um, But if you don't know Alex Stewart, he is one of the greatest England batsmen of all time, one of the most capped players. He played 133 tests, 170 ODIs. Um, He captained England. He's got a gate named after him, his own gate with his name all over at the Oval Cricket Ground um, in Surrey, which is a a major stadium and also works in the media as a pundit. And I've been fortunate enough, one, growing up to watch him, but two, now I get to work alongside him. He's actually one of my bosses. Um, So, you know, this is a it's a it's a fun you know, interview that I really enjoyed. Um, I guess what you'll take away today is there's quite a few things. I think one thing that Stewie, I'm going to call him Stewie, does is he has most of some of the highest standards of someone I've met. And I, you can see why he's been successful in the ventures he's gone down because uh, he's someone who kind of speaks through actions rather than words. He, um, you know, everything he does is has to be of a high standard and you'll hear his mindset behind that and why he does that. He's also got very strong values, very straight down the line. Um, you know, I love the way he communicates uh, and creates respect. I think just because you know that you know where you stand is a really uh, powerful thing. I think that a lot of us could learn from. Also, I ask him questions about things like how do you go from being good to great and really achieving that mastery. And also, one of the things I really enjoyed is how you handle pressure. And it was great to hear him sort of digest and talk about how he reframes the thought about pressure, not taking it on internally, but finding a way to dispel it and and really make it easier to process. So really fascinating insight today. So make sure you tune in. Any questions, feedback, thoughts, please get in touch. Um, Also, if you're enjoying the podcast, leave a review, whether it's on iTunes. I'm starting to get some reviews in, which is awesome. But any reviews are great, whether it's SoundCloud, Stitcher. I'm now on Spotify as well. So get involved. But do sit back, enjoy this episode, and no doubt you'll enjoy it as much as I did. Right, let's get started because this is going to be fun. Okay, first of all, I'm going to introduce this as your first proper title. The first time I've ever ever Alex Stewart, OBE. First of all, welcome to the Art of Success podcast. Absolute pleasure to be here, Ebony. <laughs> you sound posh there. I've never heard you you uh, be so professional, but I thought we'd start it on the right footing and then I'll get straight into calling you Stewie. Quite right. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to run through your CV quickly. Um, before I do though, the first thing I noticed on your stats when I was looking at it is you have bowling stats in test cricket. Uh, you've bowled 20 balls, 13 runs, no wickets at an average of 3.19. Now I had no clue. I don't have any memories of you bowling. Do you remember bowling? I do remember bowling. If you can use the term bowling, I let go of the ball <laughs> and the umpire was stood alongside me when I did it. Well, I, s- I saw, I went on YouTube. Did you watch and it? And I saw two balls. The first delivery was short and wide to Richie Richardson. Yeah. 
Um, and then the next one was a full toss. Full toss. Didn't you see the three bouncers I bowled and three balls and got warned? Yeah, well, look, uh, what happened to your bowling career? Let's forget, we'll come to the batting, but what happened to your bowling career? It never really took off. Though I did take three first-class wickets, which you probably didn't know, did you? Because no, you only looked at test stats. I did, yeah. Yeah, three first-class wickets, two with bouncers, yeah. and one pitched up LBW. Okay, so there, there was some talent there, but it, no. it just... <laughs> Talentless. Me and bowling do not really go hand in hand. Okay, okay. Well, I'll leave that, but let's talk about your strengths first of all. Um, I'm going to run down your seat. I know you know these, but anyway, 133 tests, um, 170 ODI caps. Of course, you predominantly open the batting, but uh, varied. You got a century in your 100th test, which is, I think is pretty cool. Um, <laughs> I, I, it is pretty cool. You don't think it's... It is. It is. It's there. It's just, <laughs> I hadn't used the word cool, really. I just thought, yeah, I was quite happy with that. Okay, pretty proud. Um, you took over captaincy um, from Afton in 98, which was interesting. Um, and you also led the side to its first major win in 12 years against South Africa. What I thought was interesting as well about you taking over captaincy was you're 35 at the time. And one of the things that stood out about you is your fitness. And um, when I was reading a bit, people said, um, you know, it doesn't matter about age for you. you your standards were always so high that when you took over the captaincy, age wasn't a factor because you kept yourself in such good order. Um, and that's been something that, since I've known you, your standards have always been up there. If you haven't got standards, what's the point of doing anything? Um, my big thing, and it was instilled into me at a young age by Dad, is whatever you do, do it the best of your ability because you're in control of that. Mm. Uh, yes, you'll get assistance, you'll get help along the way, but you're in charge of what you can do. Um, if it's if you're going to do it, why not do it to the very, very best, as against just playing at it? Mm. Um, and fitness, yeah, is a part of it. How you go about training, how you go about playing, how you go about preparing and then performing. It all goes hand in hand. Uh, and someone who doesn't prepare well or doesn't give themselves the best opportunity of succeeding will succeed, mm. but intermittently. Mm. And I wanted to say to try and be the best I could be every single day. And I enjoyed it. You know, people go, oh, that sounds rubbish. But I enjoyed challenging myself and not letting myself down, let alone my teammates mm. and everyone else. How early did that mantra come into your life? Was it, you, you said your dad influenced you. Was it something from you can remember being young or did it kind of kick in at a set stage? No, I think it, it was young and people said, geez, you must have had a boring life. I've loved it because hard work, people say, well, you know, do you never have any rest? I, I don't see it as hard work. You know, mm. playing cricket... What better life can you have? You know, we've both played cricket. Um, we both started off as a, oh, I don't like the word hobby, but that's really what it was. If mm. I wasn't being paid, I'd still have played. Um, so therefore, once I was being paid, yes, it becomes a job. But every day I walk through the gates here at the Oval or through the gates of any cricket ground, whether it's to play or train, mm. I loved it. It's something to look forward to. And even now, you know, I'm in a very fortunate position to be director of cricket here at Surrey. Uh, and though I'm not playing, um, coming through here to try and have an influence on Surrey's success and even seeing our young players come through or other players just get selected for England. Tom Curran has just been called up to go mm. out on the ashes. First saw him as a 16 or 17-year-old. It's brilliant. You know, you feel you've, you've played a small part through the way you've gone about your own job. I want to, I want to some of the things you've picked up on as well, what you're doing now, like you say, director of cricket here. Um, you talked about Gates. And I know that you now walk through a gate with your own name on it, which I'm going to use the word cool again, but that is cool. Uh, it is because most people are dead, I think, when they get <laughs> something like that um, given to them or, or named after them. So, listen, I, when I finished playing in uh, 2003, then you know I'd had 23 years with Surrey as a player and was lucky enough to play for England for 13 or 14 years or whatever. And the club said, we want to mark your career mm. in, in a certain way. Uh, and this is what we'd like to do. Well, it's not something you're going to say no to. Mm. Uh, and it's brilliant. You know, it's now there. Um, at times, it's been embarrassing twice when I've gone to go through those gates and they've stopped me. <laughs> I've had no identification. No, I had to say, sorry, but that, that's me without being too arrogant <laughs> and had a laugh about it. But no, I mean, it's fantastic. You know, And do you feel with your dad now getting the pavilion? Has he, has he won has up Has he outdone you? me? He says he has. I look at it slightly differently because, yes, it's a Mickey Stewart pavilion, but to get to the pavilion... You have to walk through some <laughs> gates. So the first thing, first things first, are the gates. That's pretty cool. But he will disagree. 
<laughs> right, I want to delve into your um, career a little bit. One thing I do want to say, and you know this because I've said it to you a lot of times, but you were... Speak up. My, yes, you want to speak very <laughs> loud on this, don't you? You were my cricketing idol as a kid. Um, you know, when I first got... You didn't have to add as a kid. It sorry. means that I'm very old and you're young. Possibly there's some age difference, but we won't go into the details. I'll take away the word possibly. <laughs> but the one thing... So, I want to start with this, and even though this is a bit of a joke, actually there's a serious question behind it, which is you used to do the black bat twiddle thing, didn't you, uh, before you bat? And I tried to mimic that a lot as a kid. Guess what? I ended up dropping the bat a lot careless. and gave up with it because it just didn't work. But I always wonder, was there anything in that for you? Were, you? were you anchoring yourself or was it just a twitch? Or what was that? I don't know when it crept in, but I can only ever remember doing it. And it became part of my routine. Um, and there's been benefit matches or charity games when it's suddenly, I'm batting, it's suddenly come over the PA system that if I can go a hole over without twiddling my bat, mm-hmm. someone will donate X amount towards the, the charity. <laughs> and I promise I have to put the bat on the floor. You just can't. Yeah. And then I, which sounds ridiculous to mm. anyone listening to this, but that's, I had to put the put the bat on the floor and then literally pick it up from the wrong end pick it up from the toe so that you didn't yeah so I didn't then flick it about um and just about got through it but it was a nightmare trying and even now so if I'm in the dressing room and the lad's got a new bat or I pick up one of their bats straight away I will twiddle the bat so do you think it helped you and like did was it part you say it was part of my routine so I'm big on routines um I don't call them superstitions I call them routines um but it part of that was part of my process Mm to then get ready to face the next ball mm. and then you'd go away face that ball walk away relax and then refocus mm-hmm. and all that was part of my refocusing um, I'm going to go straight in with a question which I ask everybody and I'm, I want you to re- reflect on your career as a player but also now um, as you moved into more leadership role if you were to put the finger, your finger on the one thing whether it's characteristic or a person or influence, what's the one thing that's helped you be successful? The most important thing? Determination, I would say. Determination to be the best I could be. Um, Because, again, it was something that Dad said to me, but something I picked up on at at a young age, that if you succeed, then the hard work that you put in has been worthwhile. Mm. But if you fail, then you want to know you couldn't, couldn't have done any more in trying to succeed. Whereas if you fail and then reflect and say, I actually came off the training ground mm. early, I didn't go to the gym, I had a late night or whatever, then who's the idiot? You know, mm. it's you, you haven't prepared well enough, mm. therefore you've actually prepared to fail. Whereas I try and take that excuse culture out of my life or out of my, my sporting life, and make sure that I did everything possible to try and succeed. It didn't work every time, mm. but I'd look back and go, I don't think I could have done much more in trying to be successful. Can you think of early memories, whether it's playing, or even I know you played football as a kid as well, anything that kind of said, I, and that was a moment I knew I had that bit of grit and determination? Uh, Dad tells a story, and whether it's right or not, his memory's going at his age, <laughs> but he evidently took me to QPR. Loftus Road to see QPR play Chelsea and before the game this was we were sat there and it was whatever it was full up back in those days was it 25,000 whatever and he and he could see I was enjoying it I was whether I was 9 or 10 10 or 11 Mm. years of age and he just he said do you know what of all these people in this ground only one person will make it as a professional sports person Wow! Wow. And and I evidently replied well that will be me now, whether that happened, I can't tell you. He swears blind it did. Yeah. Um, and if, that, if I was 8, 9 or 10, 11, whatever I was, perhaps that was, mm. it was already in me yeah. that with my approach um, was to there. what I wanted to be and what I wanted to do. That's really powerful. That's a young age to kind of set out your stall to say, you know, I want this, I want to be part of something, whether it was football, whether it's yeah, I've I can only ever remember growing up, you know, having a bat or a ball. Mm. You know, toys, I'm sure I did, because mum and dad will tell me that, that, that <laughs> I did have to. But I, I can only ever remember wanting to play mm. sport, whether it be in the garden, down the park. Um, 
at the local cricket club, football club, or whatever. Mm. Um, it wasn't you know, say obsessed. Others may say, well, it is an obsession. But I've always loved sport. Mm. I, but I've loved competing. Mm. You know, I can't just play at things. Um, if I if I take part, I want to win. You go all out. And even now, though I, I packed in playing back in say two thousand and three. You know, people say, oh, you still must play the odd game of cricket. I said, no, I don't. I played mm. one game since, um, which was down in Australia at the old club that I used to play at for England against an Australian mm-hmm. cricket board 11. Um, but I won't play any form of cricket because if I did, I'd still want to do well. Mm-hmm. And to do well, I'd have to go and train and practice. And I've done that. Mm. Um, so that's why I won't play. Why do you think you made cricket and not football? What, what, could you have made it? What, why did it not happen for you? Uh, yeah, better at cricket. Yeah, I'd love to have played football. Football mm. was my first love, I'll be honest. Mm. Yeah, I wouldn't swap anything that I've achieved in, in cricket. But now football, I've always enjoyed and still enjoy. Um, and given a choice back at back at um, fourteen mm. fifty, I'd have gone the football route, but I wasn't going to be good enough. Mm. You know, I flirted with it, but wouldn't have delivered. Yeah. Um, and then cricket. Once that was quite clear um, that I was going to be better at cricket, I've put all my you attention all into in. trying to be the best cricketer I could. I know it's your football obsession on Twitter because I can never get. It's Chelsea, isn't it? I'm not into football, but every time your tweets come through, correct, it's just non-stop. Chelsea, an amateur stuff. side called Corinthian Casuals, who, who I did play for. Well, do your homework. I <laughs> didn't right, see that. I picked we? up Chelsea. You know, Chelsea, Matt, who's season ticket holder, but now I've always supported Chelsea. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Corinthian Casuals is a very famous amateur okay. club, um, which I played for and will still support. Okay, okay. So you're still trying to keep that football flame burning. Yeah, for until you. a year and a half ago, I still played. And I only took a phone call yesterday from somebody who wanted me to play again. But at my mm. old age, I'm not convinced. Mind the knees. Correct, and everything else. <laughs> right, question that I would like to get your insight on. Uh, and I'm going to say this based on your career, but also the likes of someone like Sangakara, who was here this year. What does it take to go from good to great? Talent, obviously, but also understanding, I think it's understanding your talent, understanding your strengths, and obviously minimalising your weaknesses. Mm. Um, because the less mistakes you make, the better you are. Uh, and Sangakara, don't talk about me, let's talk about Sangakara. This year, um, he has been astonishing. So he announced his retirement from first-class cricket in May. And he's then been unbelievable for the rest of that summer. Mm. Uh, and I actually think he played better this year than I've ever seen him play before. Uh, one, because he wanted to get out on a high with people saying, please carry on. Mm. Um, but also, he understands his game. So once you understand what you can do and appreciate what you can't do, the number of errors you make will be reduced mm. and therefore your chance of being successful is there. But it's a mental thing mm. as well as a talent thing. So you've got to have the, the mental desire uh, and the way you then apply that to the job in hand. Can you unpick a little bit um, how you, if you look back, how you discovered your strengths so, and, and weaknesses? Like if you went back to early career when maybe you didn't know your game or you didn't understand yourself... Uh, unpick that a little bit for me well again again I was brought up that the ball is there to be hit you know batting's about scoring runs mm. uh, to score runs you've got to hit the ball whereas you talk to other people well you've got to make sure you survive if you survive to me that's a defensive mindset and a mm. defensive way of playing whereas if you take the attacking option all the time you have a far better chance of being successful um, and that's what I try and talk to our players or like to see the teams I'm, I'm involved in play. Don't be afraid of failing. Mm. Always take the attacking option, but then it comes back to working out. If you keep doing something that keeps failing, mm. don't do it. Yeah. Um, so for me, a strength of mine is, was I time the ball nicely. I could punch a ball well off the back foot. And then other times I'd nick it to, to slip or gully. Mm-hmm. Because I was playing at ball, say, on fifth stump, whereas when it was on th- on the off stump or mm-hmm. fourth stump, I'd punch it through extra cover okay. for four. But I'd still try and do the same when the ball was that little bit wider, wider and, and you'd end up. It. Yeah. And eventually, you work it out through advice mm-hmm. um, from your coaches that work it out. Mm-hmm. You know, work out what balls you can score off and then what balls you have to let go. Mm-hmm. And it took me a while, you know, I was because I didn't want to give up my strength, which was Because it was your best, yeah. And I, so I didn't give up that strength. All I did was work out where my off stump was, where fourth stump was, and where I could still play it from are. there. And then when was it too wide, mm-hmm. where, going very technical, I was playing outside my eye line, mm-hmm. and therefore 
the percentage opportunity of, of succeeding was diminished and it went more in um, favour of failing. So stop playing that shot when the ball's too wide. But the thing is with cricket, though, and this is one of the most unique sports, whereas football you get on the field, you can make a mistake, you can get over it. Cricket, you... It's, it could be easy to go into your shell because you snick it to fourth stump, job done. How did you um, maintain that balance between not worrying about getting out, playing your, with freedom, um, and still being able to play that expressive shot? Like, How did you manage that balance? Again, it takes time because you've got to understand your own game. But again, if you're going to fail, mm. almost fail on your terms. If you're going to succeed, succeed on your terms. So you know, a number of times throughout my career, I, I would have been going into a game, perhaps playing for my place in the side. But I still wanted to play my way. Mm. But you can still play to a situation but you play in a secure way, but mm. still in a positive way, yeah, yeah. which I hope makes sense. It's it does, not a yeah, contradiction. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So again, you know, if you never hit a ball, you're never going to score. Nothing's going to happen. You know, so what, what's the point? It's not about survival. It's actually about succeeding. Mm. So yeah, it, at times I'd get out playing an attacking shot mm-hmm. and people go, oh, why didn't he let that go? But then you have to weigh up. How many runs does that shot normally bring you mm. against the number of times it gets you out? Mm. And once you've worked that equation out, then it's telling you or telling me as, as the person who's making that decision with the bat in my hand whether it's a sensible option mm. or a stupid option. And does this apply to taking risks as well? So obviously there's generally you're quite an attacking person, you wanted to go out there and be more positive than anything, but also there'll be a time within a game, whether it's a test match and you have to weigh up, is this time to take 100%. the attack? So uh, play the situation, but still never ever miss out an opportunity of scoring mm. so if you're batting to save a game or you're batting you know you're behind the eight ball and it is about almost batting time to secure the draw or to make sure you, you avoid the follow-on or you, you're a certain number of wickets down you're just trying to get close to the opposition's target you still don't want to miss out on scoring mm. because as a batsman the idea is I keep saying is to score runs so even though you are trying to survive as such still score mm. just make sure you're scoring 100 percent safe and not going outside mm. of what you know you can do so it's managing the risk really that's all the it? risk managing, and reward yeah. you know that that's that's what it is um because you know, we all look at a scoreboard if you if you're stagnated on a certain score it's, it's pretty boring yeah, yeah and yeah. you then ha- i actually believe you then get a, meg- a negative mindset which can then all of a sudden mm. affect how you play Whereas if you're still in that, now the ball's hit there to be score, scored off, but also I'm going to be tight, I'm going to defend, or I'm going to let mm. go of the ball, then you're really focused. And that's why, you know, going back to Sangyakara, who's spoken of it, he got that down to a T. So he could play certain situations with the scoreboard still ticking over, but such low risk chance of him getting out. Mm. And that's, to me, what a good player or a great, a great player, player does. is all about. So, uh, and, and it's kind of going back to the analogy of what your dad said about the stadium and only a few people make it. And now that you're in this position of seeing younger players come through, how much can you work with somebody's mindset to, to help them kick on? It's massive now. You know, say a sports psychologist and all kinds of help, which is great. You know, mm. back in the day, it was you, it was your coach, work your it parents, out. <laughs> work it out yourself. And you still have to work it out for yourself. Because mm. if you're solely reliant on your sports psychologist or your coach off the field, mm. once you get on the field, they're not there. Now, they can train the brain. I get that. But you are the decision maker. You're going to decide, am I going to play at that ball, let it go or defend it? So the more decisions that you can make yourself, the quicker you will learn. Mm. But always seek advice along, along the way. So a sports psychologist, can they give you a formula to actually mm. prepare, mm. talking about my back twiddling did you, or, did or you whatever. Did you use any psychologists? Or was I suppose they were just coming into the game, you mm. know, when I was packing in. Um, but, again, without you should never stop trying to learn. Mm-hmm. I was quite comfortable in what was working for me then. Mm-hmm. If I was playing now, I would like to have one available to me. I'm not saying I, you don't want to be reliant on mm. them, but you want to have contact the with insights. them because they can train the brain. Yeah. You yeah. know, so that so you are in cer- certain areas where... This is my method. It's working. Mm-hmm. And then when you're having a bad day, are you then going to have a checklist of, well, what aren't I doing? Mm-hmm. Forget the technical, where your head is, where your feet are moving. But is your mind right? If your mind's not right, can you then use the sports psychologist mm-hmm. tricks mm-hmm. that you've been working with and training 
to get you back into almost the moment. Almost maximise it. Yeah. Uh, an interesting thing, so I listened to the Finding Mastery podcast you did, and one thing that I thought was interesting that you said is something like, I'll read the quote, that you didn't say, you, you didn't feel you're the most talented cricketer, but you made the best of every ounce you got. And you said that was through your preparation and through leaving nothing to... Is, is that true? Would you, you know... I, uh, clearly, after seeing you, you know, one of the most capped players for England, um, your career is. Were you not the most talented player and you just maximised, or do you think you actually had? No, I, th- I maximised my talent, mm. but I've played with far more talented players mm. than me. Um, and that's what, that's the important thing is making full use of what you, you, you've heard that term, controller controllables. Mm. I can only do what I can do, I can't do what Brian Lara can do. You know, mm. he was a genius, mm. you know, talking about my era. He was the best player that I played against. Mm. He just he took batting to another level. So I didn't have his talent, but I'd like to think that my preparation and attention to detail, willingness to learn mm-hmm. and everything else was at least on a par, if not better, mm. than Brian's. So I want to dig into a bit deeper. Were you a goal setter, right? I want to achieve X number of runs or were you a more process driven? Like what sort of no, goals did you innings, set? and again, you know, Cricket as a batter, people talk about hundreds. Mm-hmm. You know. So, yeah, hundreds is great. But don't get out. You know, when you get to 100 and you think, oh, I've achieved my goal, mm. you then get out. Mm. When And if you look at it, the number of people that get out between 100 and 110 mm. is a large, large number because they've almost they've got gone, over milestone. Oh, I've reached it, thank goodness. Relax, careless, get out. Get out, yeah. So I should have scored more hundreds in my career. 100 percent um got too many scores between sort of 65 and 90 um but i used to score my runs in lots of 10 Mm. so yes was i goal set a short-term goal setter because if you just say i've got to get 100 i've got to get 150 and you're taking guard on north Mm. that's miles away yeah it's too far so one of my processes was very much I'd score in 10. So I'd do it in 10 singles, even mm. though I was a boundary hitter. I used to do it, right, I need 10 singles is my, is my first target. And I might go one, one, then I hit a four. I'm on six. Mm-hmm. Maths is good. <laughs> I go, right, I still need four singles. I then might hit the next ball for four, not because I'm thinking I've got to get to 10. But it just is it what just happens happened. to be delivered, yeah. got to send right. First one ticked off. Mm-hmm. I'm now going to get 10 more singles to get to 20. And that was how I did it all the way through until eventually I got out, whether mm-hmm. it's for 12 or whether it's for 180 mm-hmm. or whatever. Um, but they were my short-term goals because the long-term goal, I believe, should never be achieved because mm. once you've achieved it, where do you go? Whereas so you need short-term goals, mm. longer-term goals, but never have a final goal. If That's you, really interesting. Well, because if you get a final goal, what do you then do? You're done. So I'm just going, I might be wrong here, but 2005, mm-hmm. England won the Ashes. Mm-hmm. We haven't won them since 86 7, I think I'm right in mm-hmm. saying. They won in 2005, and then what happened? They almost fell off the cliff. Yeah, so, yeah, I'm, yeah. so I've always used the analogy. It's like they've just climbed Everest. Yeah, and that's... But where do you go? We well, you can only go down. 2009, the year the women, part of that, when we won the Ashes, uh, World Cup, World T20. Next couple of tours, cramped to a West Indies, which were very weak, just lost everything. And you, you just... Because so we achieved that World Cup goal. That, so that's what I'm saying. So as soon as you win, Celebrate. I'm massive on celebrating yeah. success and yeah. recognising and celebrating success at the correct way and correct levels. But also then say, right, well done. Brilliant. We've just won the Ashes mm. or we've just won a World Cup. That's just the start of it. Mm. Now, the next series, can we do this? And, what, and then you have another process, another target to achieve so that you keep trying keep to better going. yourself. So how do you apply that now? So now your, your role is slightly different and you're looking at the performance environment. Um, do you take the same approach of, you know, smaller chunks or do you go, right, now you're more in, I suppose, big picture, you've got to consider more people. How do you go about thinking about setting goals? No, we're, um, we're about winning, mm. you know. You, you get judged on winning trophies. Mm. Now, to win trophies, you've got to be moving in the right direction. Mm. So if you want to draw a progress chart... Are you on the upward curve you, all the time? Are you achieving these short-term progress yeah, yeah. chart um, targets? So if you keep doing those, mm. you should. No guarantees. No one has a right to, to actually lift a trophy. Mm. But if you're doing those, then you should achieve 
success. It's just a question of when. Mm. So you work at Surrey, I work at Surrey. There is an expectation here mm. that we have to win trophies, mm. whereas at perhaps other counties it, it's not quite the same. I know that because I've been, at, you know, been mm. at the club for you know a long, long time. <laughs> um, so I understand that. So that's why the processes you try and put in place mm. will try and create sustained success. You can get short-term success, but to me that's quite a shallow way of doing it. Mm. So the way we're trying to do it here is very much win something and then I think we'll continue to win because of the processes and the foundations that are put in place Mm -hmm. and people understanding what success might look like Mm. and not it's not just go and get the best players bring them in it's trying to win as I call it the Surrey way which is with a lot of people have come through our system Mm. understand what Surrey is about be proud about the three feathers on your chest or on your cap and then those people have come in from the outside Mm -hmm. bring them into the Surrey family so that we're all going in one way and then get success Mm -hmm. and then more success Mm -hmm. and along the way we'll also see that's team success individuals will be striving for that success Mm -hmm. but also will be going off and playing for England which again is reflected success of on the county things happening of what at we've the set up goals. and are moving forward talk to me about the um, creating the environment because one thing that and you know you've had people that have been considered players like KP through to younger players coming through just a diverse range of individuals how do you go about managing an environment with different types of characters different ambitions how do you create that culture first of all it's a massive challenge you know and it, it always needs upgrading and, and rechecking and rebooting um, but first of all, people have got to understand why they're here. Mm. You know, why are they at Surrey? Do they want to be at Surrey or is it because they just are at just Surrey? Just going through, yeah. So the way I'll try and put playing staffs together is, is very much, obviously, you've got to look at talent, mm. but look at character as well. I, I personally believe you can only change character by about single-figure percent, mm-hmm. and it might be 2 or 3%, because when push comes to shove, people revert back to type. Mm. So try and get the right characters That's in. That's really interesting. Obviously with the right talent, and then cry, try and make sure that enough, as I call it, good people who are strong characters, personalities, can help mould and shape the group. Mm. And the very best teams or squads are self-run, and though there'll be direction from management, the real best ones come from within. So mm. it's almost player-led, because if all their players are ever hearing is from the coaches and management, this is what you have to do, you haven't done this, you mm. haven't done that, they're not thinking for themselves again. Yeah. Whereas if player take, players take on self-responsibility and mm. collective responsibility, I think they grow as a group mm-hmm. and therefore enjoy each other's individual success, yeah. but most importantly enjoy group success. And they drive it from their own, like you said, their own, their own energy, desires. their own desires. Yeah. Um, and, and I suppose then that means that, but then that requires, I suppose, open communication between. Yeah, which again is is difficult, mm. you know, because again there'll be some people who are very open and will come and chat. Mm. Others bottle things up, um, and we don't get it right. You know, mm. not, I don't think anyone gets it right because um, if they did, you know, it would be out there, it'd mm. be on prescription. So you always as I say trying to find ways to get the best out of that individual, best out of that group. Trust and honesty is massive, mm. uh, and quite often that means being harsh and hard. Mm-hmm. But you know, if it's for the good of the the, the setup, mm. then sorry, honesty is the be- always the best policy in, yeah. my, in my opinion. And if you're always being honest, then the people you're talking to or working with mm-hmm. accept it when it, it they're not hearing exactly what they want to hear, but at least they, they know, know it's the it's honest coming. answer. One thing that you, um, one thing I really respect about you is you're very straight down the line. I don't think you, uh, you know, you're never in Except doubt. For my email, I think. <laughs> yeah, just everyone, just as a little <laughs> a side note, I sent Stewie a nice, hi Stewie, can I steal some of your resources and money type email, which you kind of responded straight back, pretty much. <clears throat> Here's the un- line. You understood. Didn't you? <laughs> yeah, I did. It was you a very it? sharp email. <laughs> Polite though. Polite. Um, and I, and I, you know, I'll add that to also the first time we sat down when I got the opportunity for the role and one of the things you said to me is be yourself and be honest like be very straight is that is that a you know ingrained skill from your your background and your family how did you kind of yeah, establish that I, I think so because again it's what why wouldn't you want to be mm. honest and straight 
You know, because it can. Now, no one likes passing on bad news. Yeah. It's great. It's, it's great and easy passing on good news. Well done, you've been selected. Well mm. done, you've here's a new contract. The hard ones are, you're not playing today, mm. and you're getting a sack. The you difficult know, that, that, conversation. Stuff but if you've been honest throughout, and the feedback has been consistent, then though people may not like what they're hearing, in cold light of day, and when they go away and reflect they should appreciate what has been said to them. Mm. It's when you talk around in circles or one day you say this and the next day you say that mm. and you're contradicting each other and then you've got to have a really good memory. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Whereas if you're honest and direct, it, it just is straightforward. Yeah. Did you enjoy leadership as a whole? So I'm t- thinking now more as a captain. Um, did you enjoy that yeah, process? I, or I did, but I, I, I never set out to be a captain if that makes sense. Mm. Um, whereas I played with Nasser Sain, I would suggest he would say, no, his ambition was to captain England. Mm-hmm. My ambition was always to play for England. My ambition was always to play for Surrey. And the captaincy was, when I say an added bonus, it's, <laughs> captaincy is overrated because mm. it's a really tough gig to take on mm. um, because of the expectations, the extra workloads and everything else while still trying to make sure you perform yourself. So when you do it, or it's because someone or a group of people believe that you are the right person to lead the team. And if you feel you can do the job, you say yes, which is mm. what I said when I was asked to captain here at Surrey and then captain England. But it was never my main ambition. You know, it, in fact, I don't think it was ever an ambition. Mm. It was an honour, mm. massive honour. Uh, and once I'd thought it through about can I do it, will it affect my... Because as a captain, you know, people say, oh, it's important that you captain a successful side. Mm. Yes, but it's most important that you do your job first and foremost, which is a batsman is to score runs, mm. and then it's to captain. Whereas if you put all your resources into captaining... And then you lose... Then you lose what you're actually in the side for, which is to score runs. Mm. And if you're just in the side of captain, you're playing with 10 men. But you also had a lot to manage in terms of once Jack Russell moved away, you've got the keeping element as well. So, you, you know, you were... Yeah, but... So there's a lot to manage. No, there, there, there is, but don't take something on that you don't think you can do. Mm. You know, simple as. You know, mm. don't just say yes for the sake of saying yes. You've got to think these things through. Mm. Um, so it's easy just to get caught up in the, excitement in the headlines. Of, yeah, the, yeah. The, 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 and all that. There he is, England captain or Surrey captain or whatever. But then becomes responsibility. Mm. So think it through. Mm. You know, can I really do this? Is this what I want? Will it take away the enjoyment of what, I, what I'm currently doing? Do I really want to be a part of management? Do I want to be responsible for 10 other people in that dressing room and, and beyond? Do I want to be the person that mm. people come to me with their problems with? Um, can I also manage... <laughs> sounds quite like, as you're saying it, it's no, like, but that's a it, lot, isn't it? I'm saying. Yeah. Can, I ma- can I manage every individual on, on an individual basis? Then can I address them collectively? Mm. Um, do I want to go to meetings? Do I want to have to go and talk to the media um, before a game, after a game? If it was just about putting the armband on, going out there and directing traffic, I yeah, come and have a bowl, mm. I think we'll go with this field. That's, in a way, the easy part. Mm. But it's everything else that goes with it, which... At times, I think people don't realise, don't understand or, f- or conveniently forget when they say yes to captaincy. Mm, mm. And then they're thrown in at the deep end. And it's a and lot. can they sink or swim? Yeah. Um, last couple of questions. One, I'm really interested in how you managed pressure. And I think there's two questions I've got around pressure is, one, was there a pressure of your dad having a name in the game and being an England test cricketer himself? And the other is how you managed the media and the pressures that came with that while trying to perform so both of those questions well first I'll throw it back to you what is pressure outward expectations hearing it constantly so I could imagine every time someone will stop you 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 know especially during your peak of your career they're going to be asked you you know go out and good luck in that talk it's just constant yeah yeah, so I actually the word pressure we all use the word pressure don't Mm. get me wrong but it's more next I prefer the word expectation Mm, mm. so I just say, did I put pressure on myself? No, but my expectation was to perform. Okay. So you try and dilute the 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 word. The, the, the word. Mm. So dad, you know, being the manager when I signed here at Surrey, being a team manager mm. when I first played for England, was there pressure on me? Well, I didn't put him in that role. Mm. You know, it's just so happened that yeah, he's related to me, mm. uh, and I was a player. So it was a an outside an outsider looking in. 
you know they use that word nepotism mm. and, and mm. all all over it's international sport or it's professional sport nepotism doesn't come you're either good enough or you're not mm. uh, you know dad dropped me picked me dropped me um, but I didn't I never had a dad at work mm. I had a manager or a coach when I was at home I had a dad mm. and that was something we discussed before I signed my first pro contract at Surrey at 17 year old is that there will be people who say he's, he's only playing because mm-hmm. um, et cetera, you know, that type mm-hmm. of thing, which is it's cheap, mm-hmm. poorly thought through Just words or journalism there, or whatever yeah. it may be. So we addressed that. And it was very, I never called dad, dad, when I was in at cricket. Oh, really? No, he was always manager or yeah. coach or juror. Yeah. A few other words, but not, <laughs> not what they could hear. Yet at home, he's dad, mm. you know, and I'm lucky I have a brilliant, I've always had a brilliant relationship with him. Not, he hadn't just been my daddy, not just man, he's been my best mate. Mm. Um, so I was very lucky from that point of view. So I never felt any pressure, mm. um, using that word, yeah. of him being in a position where he'd be a part of the selection panel or the coach yeah. or the manager of any team I played in. Did you feel expectations to be good because your dad... I was better than him, so it was all right. <laughs> but no, no it, it, but it came back to me wanting to do well, yeah. wanting to do well for me, From wanting to do well yeah. for the team. So that that was never an issue. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'd like to think if you ask anyone who was in a dressing room when I was a player and he was manager, that he treated me exactly the same as he did any other player. And if anything, he might have been harder on me. Mm. You know, certain times I got left out of the Surrey side when I was starting off, when I felt I should have been playing. Mm. Um he said, I picked the side and this is it, you're not in it. Mm. Um, so that might have counted against me for actually, it may have counted against me not being selected on the 86 87 Ashes tour mm. when James Whitaker was selected. It was his first tour as manager. Uh, and we'd had similar seasons. I was in the frame as myself, Whitaker, Bailey, Rob mm. Bailey, with the three youngsters who had a chance and they went with, with James Whitaker. Um, and I felt I had a chance, as it turned out, hindsight. I'm pleased I wasn't selected then because I probably wouldn't have been ready yeah, for yeah, test yeah. cricket. And when eventually I was picked, um, I, I was ready. So what about the media then? Media, I, I've and always what used it. You and how the advice you'd give to the young guys. Yeah, so in. I've used media to spur me on. Again, early on, I said, you can't beat the media, so why take them on? Mm. Um, so again, I've always said, I have a job to do which is then try and score runs or catch catches or whatever. The media have a job to do to try and write words or say words or or whatever it may be. Uh, Now, their knowledge, some is good, others very, very limited, Mm. but Mm. they can string a few words together. So I tried not to take too much notice. Did you read the papers? I did Did read the papers, though. So people said, why do you read? I said, because if I didn't read them, I can guarantee that it'll be a family member or a mate or a friend or someone in the pub, whatever, will come and tell you exactly what's been said mm, about you. Mm. So I'd rather know what was being written or said about me because I'd use it to spur me on. So if I was struggling mm. for form, if it's like he shouldn't be playing or this and this is, if he doesn't score runs in, in this innings, um, he'll be dropped and all that. But I'd use it as a positive mm. and flip it on my head. So flip it on its head so that when I went and did well, mm. I mean, been under the cosh probably five or six times I'd then go into a press conference Mm -hmm. and I'd got a hundred some would say we must be really pleased with the way you play today because it's been tough for you I go no I was really pleased with with how I play because I back my ability but but I'm really looking forward to and I'd look at a certain journalist (laughs) and so I'm really looking forward to seeing what that person has got to write tomorrow about me because he's going to have to contradict what he's written for the last two weeks oh brilliant so So, yeah it's just me just having won you're not beating them you've won a little battle you haven't won the war because you'll never beat beat the the media as I say but in that environment you spare but I was using that and people say, well, you're stupid. But it was my way. Because if you let the media get on top to of you, you, they kill you. Yeah. Walk all over you. Yeah. Um, and they'll say, but they've got a job to do. It's their style of paper or, or media outlet, whatever it may be. Which is fine. I get that. Mm. So that's what I'm always saying to people. Don't take it mm. too personally. They're trying to do a job. Mm. Some do it well. Others should find something Did you else ever to do. Have a NASA Hussein moment, by the way. Well, it was wasn't it, trees, was it? Was it? He put three, three fingers up, and then there was a was it Dinesh Ramdin or someone who had something on a t shirt, and after he scored a hundred, like pulled his shirt. Yeah, up. He, bit, no, Phoebe had a, he pulled. He'd written a note in his pocket. No, yeah. I didn't do anything. I never did anything as outwardly or as publicly as that. Mm. But inwardly, I knew that right. that bloke didn't want that journalist didn't want me in the team. Mm. I've gone and put in a score because I'm back in my ability and now 
in a way they're eating humble pie. They might not because they're thinking, oh, I don't really care, don't like the yeah, individual yeah. or whatever. Um, but it was my way of just saying, I've been reading what you've said. Mm. I've done my job. Now let's see if you can do yours. That's brilliant. Okay, I'm going to finish up with the last question um, because it's been great, by the way. There's so many good... Oh, you're laughing. This is the nicest I've ever been to you, I think. I was going to say. Maybe trying to get some of your budget. This. No chance. <laughs> um, right, so last question is, if you were to look at your whole career, look at, and that's including your cricket playing now in leadership, um, also the media as well, so you've done loads of things, what's the one bit of advice you'd give to your younger self that would help you achieve success? Easy leave nothing a chance and, and it's as simple as that uh, going back to the start of the conversation uh, if you really want to do something then it takes a lot of hard work but it's massive enjoyment and massive reward on the back of achieving what you set out to do so while your mates might be doing something that you really like to do socially mm. but you're saying no do you know what I'm not going out tonight or I'm not doing this I'm not doing that because I'm actually doing something that's going to help my career mm then do it mm. and it doesn't mean living like a monk or whatever it's getting that the happy medium but if you're successful you can't beat it mm. but it doesn't just happen so leave nothing to chance be the best you can be i love that stewie thank you so much for your time you've been brilliant as always so many golden nuggets so uh, look forward to this coming out thank you cheers well, what another amazing episode. I hope you took as much uh, insight and wisdom and inspiration from it as I did. I took so many tools from Stewie just listening back as well. And, and often, you know, you know somebody, but if you don't sit down and have these sort of conversations, sometimes you don't unpick the wisdom. So it was really nice to be able to do that. I think one of the most important things I take away from this interview is... I think we can all achieve more if we just go 100% in. Uh, no sort of flirting around at the edges or, you know, having regrets that we didn't quite put in. And I think that's what Stewie says to me. It's about why not just, if you're going to go for something, don't mess about, just go all in. And and I like that attitude. It's kind of an excellence mindset. It's, um, you know, also you don't want to have the regrets of if you look back and think, I could have done this or I could have done that. And when you just go all in, although you might, there might be more fear you're going to be more likely to get more success and the best out of yourself so I, th I think Stewie every time I see him or I'm around him it makes me think about upping my game I think it's really important to be around people who inspire you to do that and hopefully you got that from the podcast today I think one of the other tools I really liked hearing him talk about is reframing he didn't say those words but it's something that I hear a lot of the people I talk to do when we talked about you know how do you handle pressure straight away he he processed it you know it's not really pressure what is pressure and reframed it to talk about expectations and you could see the process in which he went through what pressure meant he, he dispersed pressure in the same sort of way found a way to handle it and even actually talks about ways of making it spurring more and that was specifically when he spoke about the media at times and and really taking it on and, and, and using it as a way or a bit of fuel. Uh, Cyril Regist as, as well, who's the footballer, talked about that in a previous episode. Really powerful. So I think there's things that we can, if we want tools to, to handle different things, if we can reframe what it means to us and, and how we're going to act as a result of that, that'll be powerful. Um, but I, I think overall, it's just listening to the whole episode just reminds me of what a high performance mindset is. And although we might not all end up being athletes or uh, necessarily the business people or whatever it is, I think you can take from these people inspiration and motivation um, to just help you kick on. A lot of people who are listening to the podcast have a range of different reasons. I've heard things from just wanting some inspiration through to wanting to make career changes through to all sorts. And I think if we can just get into that mindset that just, you know, we're going to go for our best, be our best and, and challenge ourselves. And I think that's what Alec does in this podcast for me. It just reminds me about that that mindset and, and trying to just keep growing and developing as a person. Okay, that's it for this week. Uh, been another fantastic episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget you can tune in in two weeks' time for the next episode. Any questions, thoughts, feedback, get in touch on Twitter. Please review as well if you like it um, or any questions or suggestions for guests actually which have come in while I'm out here in Australia. I've got a few interesting suggestions. Um, do let me know. Have an awesome week and look forward to speaking with you soon. <laughs>